All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Sea Mask. Uh, we're here with the Culture War Crusaders themselves, and actually, we have a stand-in guest today in light of today's uh, episode subject matter. We have Will Noland, Nick Stumphauser, and uh, Trent Horn. Trent, how you doing this morning, brother? What's up, guys? You know, I'm here because Tim couldn't be. I've been lifting hard. Um, that's why I look so good. And I'm here to defend what I said recently def uh, when, I, when I went on attack against Tim and all the other Catholics in Catholicism. I'm going to tell you why I did that. I, I, I just want to be Trent, open you're... about something, though, guys. I, uh, Trent, I'm sorry I don't watch your channel. Um, I don't know what you said. That's right. I just said anyone that takes Christianity seriously or literally is wrong. I'm basically Jordan Peterson now. So that's that's what I said. And then and uh, what I really meant was a lot of the serious Catholics who are called, I call them fundamentalist Catholics. They're making extrapolations of what scripture and tradition and the magisterium require. By the way, your hair looks fantastic, Trent. Sorry, Will, Thank what were you going to say? Thank you. Oh, I, I was wondering whether the the main problem, Trent, with what Tim said had something to do with uh, feminism. Yes, it has to do with feminism. And yes, I'm I'm just upset that Christianity can't coexist with feminism. But um, I've never admitted that before today. But being here with you guys, I feel safe enough to do so. This oh, is good. I'm glad space. we provided a safe space for you. Yes. Yeah, it's a safe space for sure. Your recent Revenge of the Nerds video um, that you did <laughs> that kind of took the Catholic world by storm is we're going to break it down. But I, I want to start I wanted to start this off with a question. And so and this is about Catholic uh, cafeteria, Catholic feminism. How can it be that many of these so-called Catholics are feminists? Um, I don't know how to answer that, aside from saying that um, you're basically being honest and you, women are scary when you make them mad. So that you have to make up arguments out of whole cloth rather than acknowledge the truth because women are too scary. Yeah, totally. And so we wanted to get into uh, breaking down your recent video point by point. I wanted to get at the based uh, CMASK panel here to, to, to weigh in on some of the points that were mentioned amidst all the, the, the rage and straw manning. And I saw the, it starts with, with, with NFP. And there seems to be a kind of division in the, the Catholic space sphere, if you will, with, with regards to NFP. Um, so you guys, starting with, with Will, work our way down. Uh, natural family planning. The ter church teaches it as licit. Some people think it's illicit. I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts on this. Well, when most people talk about it, they're actually talking about it in a contraceptive mentality. NFP should really be something that you don't enter into lightly. It's not just for convenience reasons, which is sadly how most people use it. You should um, talk to a priest about it and see whether you truly do have grave and serious reasons um, for practicing NFP. But that's not what tends to happen. People just think, well, I'm not quite ready for kids yet, so we'll just do NFP for a couple of years. And that's not the right way to go about it. In practice, it can just end up being a subtle form of feminism in the marriage. And it's a way of not being open to life, not being open to the duties of motherhood, um, while pretending that you are. That's what I most often see. Nick, your thoughts? <clears throat> Paragraph 53 and 54 of Casti Kenubi. <clears throat> While I'm reading this, also consider um, what the Catechism of Trent says about extraordinary ministers of Eucharist and how they're supposed to be. Like, basically, there's no reason to have them almost and under under almost any circumstance. And then how ubiquitous it's become. So Casti can be written, uh, what, 30, 37, I think, 1937. And now, venerable brethren, we shall explain in detail the evils opposed to each of the benefits of matrimony. First consideration is due to the offspring, which have many, which many have the boldness to call the disagreeable burden of matrimony, which they say is to be carefully avoided by married people, not through virtuous continence, which Christian law permits in matrimony when both parties consent, yes. 
which is a reference, of course, to what St. Paul says for like prayer and fasting recent reasons. But by frustrating the marriage act, some justify this criminal abuse on the ground that they are weary of children and wish to gratify their desires without their consequent burden. Others say that they cannot, on the one hand, remain continent, nor on the other can they have children because of the difficulties, whether on the part of the mother or on the part of family circumstances. But no reason, however grave, may be put forward by which anything intrinsically against nature may become conformable to nature and morally good. Of course, that's contraception. Since, therefore, the conjugal act is destined primarily by nature for the beginning of children, those who, in exercising it, deliberately frustrate its natural power and purpose against in purpose sin against nature and commit a deed which is shameful and intrinsically vicious. <clears throat> and then later on in the document, he says that basically nothing that God asks of you is impossible and nothing that God asks of you that is good to do is something that you'll have to sin in order to do. His commandments are, uh, you can uphold them and you can uphold them with grace. So yeah, I'm totally with Will that it's it's just used because people don't want to have kids. And if for some very exigent reason, like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, it's, you, you've had seven C-sections or something, and like seven out of seven OBGYN say, like, if you have another child, you will die. Then it's like, okay, well, yeah. maybe maybe that's a good reason for it. I almost, so it's an, I almost it's said an abuse Tim, of but the illicit like, thing. Yeah, it's it, it's an abuse of illicit thing. It's just taken to an extreme. Yeah, um, but as as the um, artist formerly known as Tim Gordon would say, um, it's not an action. So, like, you can't do NFP because what you're doing is an, is to not do something. So, by definition, you can't sin in the sense of like not doing something. Um, but I I think that the the auspices under which it's done should be very much considered but are you guys talking about um are you guys talking about contraception or are you talking about uh coitus on on in on probably infertile days because they're they're very different that those paragraphs in casti are referring to contraception frustrating the marital end yes i was using it as this is tim right now i don't i don't know what happened <laughs> Trent Welcome left. back. Welcome back to him. It, yeah, Tim. Trent left yeah. so fast because you guys scorched him that he it was like a cartoon. He went and his hair just stayed here and hovered over me. So this is this is me now. Yeah, um, those those paragraphs are back. specifically about contraception. I was using it in support of what Will was saying of the contraceptive mindset of mm -hmm. abstaining from sex on the fertile days, which is like uh he's he's describing here that the perspective of married people that children are a burden is basically what gets you to most normie Catholics to doing NFP versus the openness to life perspective. See, I don't, people are going to think I'm actually Trent now, but um, when Paul the sixth took this up 40 years later, he actually didn't use the word grave. So in um, Humanae Vitae, he uses the word, he uses two words to describe it serious and the, some, some um, less even less grave modifier. So the, the word grave never appears in there. Then maybe I'm maybe I'm still Trent, but <laughs> trads will add in the word grave there, and it's not the and it's Paul the sixth who's like the second liberalist pope besides Francis of the last generations. But that is um, humane vitae, and it's much more specific to. <clears throat> it's more specific than Casti Canubi. Like Casti Canubi is only saying you know. Um, you can't, you can't contracept. So Humana Vitae does not say it's only grave reasons because, because it's the use of um, something that's inherently licit. I mean, like sec, the real rules in Roman Catholicism are each act has to be unitive and procreative um, it, within marriage. So is there's not rules that bind when you're allowed to go have coitus. You know, aside from um, you know black fasts and things that have been disciplines that have been um, rendered obsolete, we don't have any disciplines in the church that say don't don't have sex on feast days anymore. But if you, if you're gonna have sex, the only rules are it has to be unitive and procreative. 
So that's why um, I always say like, and Trent, Trent's analysis was, was confused because at first he was saying trads love so-called NFP. And then he, he meant trads kind of hate it. And they do some of them, not all of them add extra stipulations, like when you can you you can use it. And I, I don't really know what it is. I guess it just means um, like algebraically isolating the, the less fertile days of the month. So there are not any infertile days of the month, by the way, because a woman's cycle can always flip. Um, so that, that, that also sort of complicates the analysis. It's, it's a dumb term, natural family planning. If people are algebraically isolating the less fertile days of the month, having unitive procreative sex, then that's not wrong. And it's also not, it's not even like contraception because as long as it's unitive and procreative, there's, it's always open to life. Like the Catholic term is open to life. So I, re I guess I represent a, um, a hornier view. No pun intended. Uh, this is a <laughs> point of view. Uh, but it works in both senses <laughs> on topic here that um, there really is no NFP. And so uh, Pius the 12th said something like, well, we'll have to look at like a couple that if they used sex um, only on the less fertile days for, for like decades or something, we'd have to look at their, their frame of mind. They're probably, they probably approached marriage um, in an anti teleological way or something, but it's not, it's not that they contracepted. It's that they don't understand that they should be having children. Yeah. That, I think that is a good clarifying point there that there's no such thing as an infertile day. So, right. so the marital act is always, uh, open quote unquote open to life. But the question of not to use a very Protestant term, but like heart posture, of okay but do you have a contracept are you open to life yes or no and it's like well technically in some ways you are because the marital act is procreative and there's no non-fertile days there's no like zero percent fertile days so in some senses you are but in the other sense of like are you this is um i guess the analogy would be like <clears throat> okay you didn't commit adultery but you looked at the woman with lust in your heart so like you didn't use contraception but in your heart you're like i really don't want this to result in children like that is definitely disordered and so can you say like nfp is a sin or whatever no you can't but i do think it's worthy worth being critical of married people who are opposed to children like that does seem to be very disordered right but that's the like contraceptive you... mentality i was talking about you're not really open to life you're, you're trying your hardest to avoid having kids this was very Trent of me, um, and, and that's appropriate because I've still got his great hair uh, on. I just think if you go to Boomer parishes, I, I would bet a large sum of money. You go to Boomer parishes, like the one right outside my neighborhood, and you have all the couples with less than five children raise their hand. Okay, there's always going to be the sum that, that had issues conceiving. I, I'm not talking about that. All of them raise your hand. Okay, did you have less than five? Did you have four or fewer children by using NFP or by using like condoms in the pill? It's it's going to be 99, probably 100% condoms in the pill. People that you, and this is where I do think Trent was basically right on what his defense is of NFP. And we don't all have to agree on this, but um, I don't think that people that use NFP because it's a pretty shitty, inefficient form of... Um, of contracepting you always end up slipping ones past the goalie because you're just kind of like all right you know it, there are method different methods of using it you always get more and more sloppy and because you you are inherently open to life insofar as you're not using what what is a redundant term patrick coffin hates it artificial contraception the real contraception those people end up having lots of kids and i would i would i would lay a lot of money on it so i think it's a false dilemma and i think but to be fair to trent i think that's what if he were you know had 10 or 15 or maybe 20 more iq points he would have put it that way the way i just did he would have said it the way i did <laughs> um i'm just joking trent um and i i just think he put it badly but i think that the simple way to say it is there aren't 
many instances, if any, of people out there that have used NFP for 30 years to only have their 1.7 like wasp amount of children. Whereas if you go into any boomer parish and you start asking people, or not that you're going to, but it would be very, very interesting. And I'm very confident what the result would be. Why do you have so many, so few children? It's all going to be, oh, condoms. I mean, boomers just use like artificial contraception that those, those numbers are in. And I, I just don't think, I think this is trads purity spiraling. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty, pretty clear to me from all the people I know that use NFP have lots of, of kids. And they're just like, we're just kind of trying not to have kids right now, but every time we do it, it's unitive and procreative, which I think proves the case. I would say that if so like in nutrition, if you ever talk to any like nutrition coach, Mike, you can attest to this. The diet that works is the diet that you stick to. Adherence is like mm -hmm. the the number one uh, characteristic of a successful diet is adherence. And so I think, Tim, to your point, what you're describing is that like NFP is on the whole kind of impossible or very, very hard. You have to be like David Goggins level discipline of like and somewhat of an OBGYN to like track her temperature and cycle and all these different things to know when she's fertile or not fertile and so on. And I would say that if that zero to one percent of uh demographic actually did make it 30 years um without having kids via NFP, it's probably because they were so adherent, they were so diligently anti-children that, that is something worth looking at like pies said like okay what is going on if they are if they did make such a um swiss cheese method like bulletproof basically like you have to really hate children if you made nfp work for 30 years i just I, it doesn't correspond to an act for for i mean i i hate even using nfp like planning things is not a sin um what you're really planning are the days not to have sex. So unless, and there's no moral theologian in the history of Catholicism that's willing to say that it's a sin not to, this is what it would require for so-called NFP to be a sin. It's a sin to not have sex on the most fertile day, the most fertile two or three days a month. It's a sin to abstain those days. Okay, no. Is it a sin to have sex on the less fertile days of the month? No. So like, it's, it's kind of just um, a dumb talk topic for dummies. Would it be and disordered? Though? Sense, well, it can't be, it can't be disordered. It, you can't, it's like saying you have a culpable mens rea with no guilty actus reus. It's just, I would like I say, say I don't, I don't think there are any, I don't think there are any instances like on planet earth of people that have four or fewer kids that got that uh, aside from just they they couldn't conceive, there are lots of those, particularly as you age. It's it's harder to get pregnant, you know, forty than thirty, obviously. But I don't think there are any of these boomer parishes of of one z, two z, three z children, which is which is pathetic. Let's be honest. And I think that's what we should lean into. If you're from if you're from a family with one, two, three children with more wealth per capita per household than has ever been had in human history. Um, they had more children with less wealth in the 19th century and back. It's just, it's, it's pathetic. It's outright pathetic. I, hear, I hope people really take that to heart. That's what needs to be taken to heart. But all of those people, the onesie, twosie, threesie households, were all artificially contracepting. So I, I just, the people that take the faith seriously enough to make sure that they're not sinning are the ones that have five, at least five kids. And, and and you also have to start getting into well, how many children do you need in order uh, to like satisfy it? What if what if you have ten kids already, and now all of a sudden it's not two kids? You have five times as many kids if you have ten than two, and now if if it were this great like Martin Luther substituted the word only for our faith mm -hmm. alone, um, trads just made up this word uh, grave reason. That's not what the the encyclical on point says it says serious or 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 like non-negligible or something which is a lower standard of review they just made this term up yeah t having 10 kids might not be a grave reason that means someone's going to lose their life or the salvation but um 
Yeah, th th there's a serious economic interest in if you have 10 kids, you're not just bitching. If you're like, I'm running out of money, I'm running out of rooms in my house and spots in my car. And I mean, like, the real ballers, the real Catholics know this is real. Like, so then when it's like, if you're in an economic strait where you can't buy a new car or a new house, um, because you have 10 kids, that's a lot more plausible than because you have two, or if you have 20. So um, I just think it's a non issue. There, um, non -issue. There's some studies on the number of kids that was average before contraception was mainstream and it's seven like most families had seven kids prior to contraception so i think there's a lot to what tim is saying there with five and under fine there'll be some people that it's nothing to do with contraception but the further under seven you get the more likely it is to be contraception rather than just nfp it's a really good point one thing i was thinking of as well that some people listening will need to hear guys who are maybe north of 30 looking to get married and thinking that they absolutely must get married to a girl in her only early 20s for fertility reasons. Not really. You can look at the studies on this too. If it's a fertility worry, um, it's 82% of 35 to 39-year-old women conceive within a year as long as they're having sex twice a week. So 82% of 35 to 39-year-olds Okay, that's the window at which most guys think that past 35, there's like no chance of kids. Compare that to age 27 to 34. What do you reckon the drop off is? Have a guess. 27 to 34 versus 35 to 39. What do you guys think? 10%. I'm going to guess if it's after like 1990, if this study's after 1990, that it's probably closer to like 40%. 86% of 27 to 34 year olds get pregnant within a year, assuming sex twice a week, 82% of 35 to 39 year olds. So it's only like a 4% difference from age 27 to 39. So I was way off. I just assumed that the younger generation just like was contracepting more. Well, th this is assuming people who are trying to get pregnant. But the point oh, is that you, gotcha you can have someone who's late 30s yeah. and their chances of conceiving, this is Tim's point about how easy it is to get pregnant um, if you're not contracepting, even with NFP, how easy it is to get pregnant. That just persists even into the late 30s because it's what's supposed to happen. And not yeah. that you should wait, but women uh, who conceive after the age of 35, their children are on average smarter. I, I don't buy the higher percentage of birth defects thing the older you get. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I haven't looked into that too much. But the IQ does tend to be meaningfully higher post-35 as well. So Yeah. So key, key point, late 20s okay. fertility and then mid-30s fertility, even late 30s fertility, basically the same. Wow. Yeah, that's well, interesting. My, uh, it... my wife turned, turned 35 with our first and then... 37 i think 36 37 with our second so i mean it, it make and it wasn't hard <laughs> it was it was actually quite smooth quite easy we we buy the doomer red pill stuff right once a woman's past like 25 she's hit the wall oh 21 I think that's a 21 it's all yeah, over. 21 yeah, yeah it's, it's over you might as well <laughs> just quit hey you know um the, the um uh mule ismail the bloodthirsty islamic ruler uh, he had a harem of 500 women and do you know what age he kicked them out at? Seven. <laughs> 30. It was game over at 30. That, that, that was his cutoff point. Um, who knows? Maybe that was for other reasons than just fertility. But uh, interesting, the stats prove him wrong. If it was kids he was after and he had hundreds of them, uh, he could have just kept them in. Interesting. That's a really good stat. I don't think a lot of people know that. I didn't. No, I had no idea. It's, no. It's Will, a white yeah, pill. Wild. Will, it do you is. have the drop off for like early 40s? I, I'm just curious. Um, I'll find it for you. I remember when I was reading through these, the further north you go of 40, the faster it drops off because obviously menopause starts coming in then often. Um, I think there was a drop off as well, not huge, from like early 20s compared to late 20s. So it does go down, right? We, we're not saying it doesn't go down, but not as fast as you imagine. That's surprising. How unfast yeah. that is. But you know okay. the key bit here? It's assuming sex at least twice a week. 
that's what the actual thing that goes wrong is most of the time. Like that's not happening. It's once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Just because dudes but, need to be in your program, Will. They need coaching. Well, or they need to get rid of weird ideas about sex that the church condemned long ago. That yeah, too, which actually segues to... perfectly. Yeah. And sorry, Nick. Sorry, go ahead, man. Or or they just need to stop watching pornography too. Like all of it. Definitely that. Yeah. So that kind of naturally segues into the second one, which is the and actually that was one of the points in the video that I actually agreed with Trent about the NFP. And then the, well, hopefully we get to this one, the veiling versus unveiling thing. So it wasn't without its errors, despite, you know, in between it kind of getting a little weird, but purity spiraling. And he managed to clip this video of, I think Gabby Castillo talking about not going to these certain dances, men and women that weren't married. And, you know, um, and I think he had a screenshot of a tweet that said uh, from this, I think there was a, this, this Thomas guy on Twitter that, hand holding and like kissing on the lips not making out but kissing on the lips was illicit behavior and shouldn't be allowed until till marriage now i'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts i mean three of us here have daughters um and we'll get to so licit behaviors in dating and then uh licit or illicit behaviors in marriage we could do a whole episode series on these alone but be curious to hear you guys weigh in on this starting with the licit behaviors in dating piece best advice <laughs> i've heard from a priest, it was, I think, um, Father Lacordaire gives this in one of his letters advising young guys it's a couple of centuries ago, but I think it's still so apt. He says, look, uh, whatever you do in front of witnesses, just keep it to that. And that's a good rule of thumb. Like if her parents were in the room, your parents were in the room, you're in public, go that far, no further. And I think that's a really good guideline. There, I think there is like a technical cutoff point where the arousal like tips over what's acceptable but even that you can't give people a clear-cut answer because hand-holding perhaps for some people it might be a real occasion of sin right but for others not same with the kiss on the lips tim didn't you mention this a few episodes back the the point at which the arousal tips over into being um sinful yeah we might have been talking about I can't remember if it was on air or off air about um, purity spiraling about about a female dress, you know, where it's like, well, if if the standard of review is go through and, and pull all males for what possibly might be a turn on, which is what a lot of these guys do, um, I, I think the same Thomas guy you're talking about, then um, you you know, you know, any kind of sandals are out because the foot fetish is a very common thing, um, you know. If a, a guy singing a woman's wrists turns them on, then that's if one guy anywhere does, then that's out. Uh, so I think I made that point. And then, um, um, so the, the point about I think the real money is morose delectation. Like if you're kind of meditating on something that that becomes an, an intentional object of lust, morose delectation in Thomas's um, terminology, then that's sinful for you mm -hmm. um so it, it in some sense this is why the church doesn't deign to speak because like i don't know you're, you're probably a sociopath if you get turned on by holding hands um you know like in in a way that's an inappropriate there's also there's also the sense of just sort of power and empowerment and excitement and titillation that goes with holding someone that you're close with holding their hand. That's not, and I think a lot of these, um, I don't know, people that are inclined to dangerous levels of purity spiraling might be confusing that for arousal. But I mean, yeah, you could pretty much objectively saying the holding of the hand, it's not an erogenous zone. And so even if someone is, I mean, I've, I've, I didn't know that handholding had been in on any of these freak lists of illicit behaviors. Uh, I, I think the, the best rule of thumb would be, um, yeah, that the anything that um, conduces to morose delectation that's pretty close to what you would do privately versus publicly. Stick to the things you would do publicly, and um, I. I don't know. I, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, make, it, that, that makes sense. I think that's what I remembered because 
um, Aquinas addresses the question, and he doesn't say that like a kiss on the lips is sinful in itself. It it might be for one particular guy who can't do it without um, thinking and feeling a certain way about it and consenting to lustful pleasure. Like it could be, but you just don't know on a case by case basis, which is why there isn't a strict rule about it. It's like saying, um, how many burgers can I eat in a day without being a glutton? Or how many peanut butter sandwiches can I have? There, there isn't like a hard number on that that the church has given. Yeah. Here's a, a clarifying question. Is arousal itself sinful? It can, like if it can occur at uh, across this gradient from looking to all the way to the marital act. As an act of will, yes. As a yeah. as a bodily act, no, obviously. Well, I mean, yeah, if, if no. you what would that what would that distinction be then as an act? Because I don't know, I like see it, arousal is like hunger, like a sneeze. Like how do you will that? Yeah, through morose delectation, lingering on a lustful thought as an act of intellect will combo. If if it's a dream that you don't choose to have. Some people try to have certain like dirty dreams though. That if it's a dream you don't choose to have or something gets th like thrust into no pun intended your your field of vision you can't um get out of the way soon enough but you're trying then it's as a bodily act no of course it's not sinful as a as a uh, voluntary act an act of the will that is then of course it's sinful because then it becomes gross delectation intentionally lingering on something that is generative of laws i would just say this i mean how could no um these these people are it's it's getting clarified they are Gnostic kind of body haters. If they, if you think there's something inherently pleasure, uh, uh, sinful about using the lips for one of their secondary ends, like kissing, then you're just not Catholic and you, you are not square with the Aristotelian function argument. Because if two people, you know, kiss, whether on the, the lips, like a peck, as a sign of affection, the way even Europeans do, or on the side of the face, or on the forehead, that's just one of the secondary ends of lips. You know, their first, their primary end is speech and gustation. Secondary end is you know, a totally valid secondary end. One of the primary secondary ends of um, human lips. Um, if it doesn't produce lust, then it's just it's it's as sinful to kiss someone on the lips in a non-lustful way as a sign of affection, like a hug uh, is literally as much a natural use of the lips as eating or whistling, you know, whistling, then whistling would have to be bad to use that example. There's nothing inherently bad in the act. Um, yeah, these are just people that don't understand natural philosophy or Aristotelian philosophy and, and, um, and, um, you know, the, the function argument. One time I was putting a picture up on the wall and I held a nail in between my lips. Yeah. Oh, that. Oh. Oh, oh, did you confess that? I was. I wasn't <laughs> sure whether I should or I shouldn't, Tim. You definitely should. I mean, I, I, I can't have on my Trent wig while I say this, but if the, um, I don't know who Gabby Castillo is. People were saying Ga Trent went after Gabby and Tim. Um, but then, yeah, like you have to put on, was it G the Gabby Castillo wig and say yes, that's sinful to hold a, um. If it's not morose delectation, then tell me what sin it is. See, there always has to be an actus reus, and these people just don't know that. You know, you you, you can't just can't just be a sin just because it involved your lip in in non eating or non um, speech. There are secondary ends, and if you're holding the nail in your lip as you're hanging a picture, yeah, that's a secondary end. Secondary ends are not inherently. Um, uh, sinful, unless they contradict the primary end. And, and then I've heard them try to say, well, they contradict the primary end because of opportunity cost. You can't be eating or speaking when you're, that's, that's not what we mean by contradict. We mean conceptually contradict, which is to say the uh, platonic principle that you can't explicate a false logoing. And you can't explicate a false logoing because um, it's like, show me, show me a uh, Show me a unicorn. Well, it doesn't exist. You can't explicate a false logo. And so to contradict the, the purpose of something means by a second purpose of a first purpose, this literally just means um, contraception contradicts conceptually the purpose. Um, doing something, doing a secondary end instead of a primary end temporarily is not a contradiction. I, I don't know. It's probably...
we're we've agreed with Trent on two out of two. We should get to the disagreeing so I can use my Jufro wig more. Um, <laughs> I think it'll be a three out of the six points that we have here. So again, not without it's it's and, and and this is another question I get from a lot of guys. And I think you guys spelled this out really nicely. It's like the difference between the appreciation of beauty and lust. It's like if you, yeah. a woman happens to be walking by and you notice and you're like, you just, okay, she's beautiful. And you move on with your day. Yeah. Like there is nothing wrong with that. It's the secondary look, the, the, uh, the morose delectation, like you just said, the pondering upon and entertaining the thoughts of lust that when it crosses that line, would you guys agree with that? Like, it's pretty simple. But I know as a scrupulous guy myself, some guys just get all caught up in this. Yeah. When it's actually pretty, say, it's not simple. Not not simple if you if you have scrupulosity. I'll I'll spend the rest of today researching morose delectation. <laughs> That's why Nick's quiet. He's just Mor clammy and anxious right now. <laughs> AJ, AJ with confession. AJ Barker, friend of the C Mask Show, had a great bit of advice for guys about this, and he said, "So so you see a beautiful woman." best thing you can do is just say a quick prayer to God and say, Lord, thank you for her beauty, the beauty of all women, your creation. And I, I pray that she stays faithful to her vow, like whatever it might be. Maybe, maybe she's married. You don't know. Maybe she's single and she's trying to stay celibate till marriage, whatever it is. Just say that. And then it benefits you spiritually. It also benefits her spiritually. And it's the best way to move on from it. No need to pretend that she isn't beautiful. Yeah. You don't have to do the, uh, Oh, this, she's like a one. I mean, like God doesn't require that we lie. It's just no homo. It should sound kind of just like, have you ever just seen like a really handsome man? I don't know. Maybe he's got amazing hair and you're like, wow, Trent really <laughs> got his act together. He looks amazing. It's just an objective intellectual thing where you're like, that's a handsome man there with that Jufro. And you're, you're not, you know, no homo, but you're just acknowledging like that guy is really kind of like when Jimmy Garoppolo came into the league, the NFL, Jimmy G, and everyone was just like, that's the handsomest man that's ever played in the NFL. That didn't mean that you're, that, that you're lusting after him. Certainly not. You're just like, he's probably going to suck at quarterback because he's just too handsome. And he did. And he was, <laughs> and um, he's basically not in the league anymore, but Jimmy G yeah, you know, whatever. That's that's objectively a handsome man. Uh, Sean Connery, all the the old '90s Sean Connery no homo jokes. He's just a handsome man, and that's basically what it is when you're acknowledging a woman's beauty, even though there there's the danger of um, morose delectation. If you're a straight man with a beautiful woman, you just have to throw throw an AJ Barker stop block in the way. It's beautifully said. So we're going to get to the disagreement here in a second. Beautiful. So let's just quickly touch on this. I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> uh, licit sexual behaviors in marriage, because the purity spiraling here gets absolutely insane. Because there's one thing, it says one thing in, in the catechism or love and responsibility by JP2. And then these trads say this other thing, and they, they, they hate sex, they hate the body. And it's I, I think that's antithetical to God's design of sex. So licit versus illicit sexual behaviors. We don't have to this spend too whole. much time on this because we're going to get into the disagreements. So this is a fucking Vietnam, by the way. Me and Will know it. <laughs> this is a fucking Vietnam. We did a whole and, show on it, like two hours on it. Yeah, yeah I remember. I listened to it. It's going to set off all the Spurgs, some of whom were named in that thing, and it's going to totally take over, blow up everything. The Viet Cong are going to be attacking, flanking us from the left. <laughs> no, go ahead. You 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 do it, Will. I mean, well, you, you get I, the quick Will answer. We, um. If it ends with you ejaculating in your wife's vagina, it's basically okay. That's the main rule of thumb to follow. That's it. Like, you, it can't be a woman who isn't your wife, right? It covers that. That's a big one. And then the fact that it has to be ejaculation in the vagina and she's not on the pill, like, that's it. Stop worrying. And that, and they, that they sums it up out. perfectly. They, they freak out that, that it's that... Um, you know, there are moral theologians that are uh, uh, talking about the early 20th century manualist, Thomistic manualist tradition. Um, there are there's disagreement am among them as to um, like the S word. Some say yes, some say no. Um, if you're getting excited about that, then you probably, mm. you know, wanted to marry a man um, <laughs> in, in like a permissive way. So there are still some 20th century moral manuals that say no, ir irrespective of where the act terminates. Um, 
but that basically the the spurgs go off on the non s word and they they go off on the like um Hummers. Well, that, they go off that leaves non ejaculative fellatio on on in play and they just they just go nuts no pun intended um so that's that now we'll have them in our comments or whatever yeah 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 that's my bit that's always been my understanding the s word stuff i always thought was illicit um and I, I, I think a, a degree of discernment is obviously needed here too, Tim, because I think if you're ruminating on those kinds of uh, that kind of behavior too much, it's probably a because of a pornographic issue or habit that you maybe haven't laid down, and or um, a Skittles uh, fantasy that you also have that you haven't fully repented of as well. I think we could yeah. probably safely say that because that's not something that I think about, nor do I want to do. Most of them yeah. say that that kind of foreplay uh, isn't okay, and they give like purely practical reasons regarding health and pain. They don't go into ways in which it contradicts um, the teleology of of sex. They just say probably not a good idea. There's a couple yeah. who say, "Hey, well, in principle, why not?" But most just say practically not smart, and I, I think that's yeah. the common sense conclusion. That's what um, I Dr. Edward Fazer says. That's what uh, Dr. Janet Smith at uh, a seminary professor says. They're like, look, I'm not speaking on my own behalf, but theoretically it's just not categorically um, um, precluded the way the way people assume it is. But it's it's gross, and, and there's practically no way to ever do it where it's not bodily harmful. Yeah, And that's, that's like not enough for the Spurgs to say – in theory, yes, but in practicality, how could you ever do S without S O D without um without doing harm? That's not enough for these people that want bright moral lines. They want more bright moral lines than Catholicism already adumbrates. And that's retarded to me. Um, and I, again, I'm with them. I don't even I don't even think that would be cool, but they know that it is inclusive of non-harmful behaviors where you can have non-ejaculative um or play in like fellatio and they just i don't know why they just go that just makes them really mad and it's because i part of the reason why to tell the full story is because there are earlier moral theologians earlier in the tradition um never in the magisterium but in the moral theologian tradition private moral theologian tradition um like alphonsus Liguori, that are very stringent on this even thomas is very stringent on this and so they say, well, that's practically like the magisterium, the moral manualists of, of the early 20th century are not. So they're, they're, it is kind of what Trent said. They're sort of making up their own rules. The church has deigned against being very specific on what's good or bad marital sex, aside from the unitive and procreative um, thing. And or um, their wives just don't want to do it to them. So they're mad. They I mad, so might. they're going to stay mad. And, and yeah. they don't want to do it to their wives because they think their uh, women's bodies are icky. That's right. Yeah. That's <laughs> so true. Okay. So on to the disagreements. And I know Tim, you, we, I mean, you've talked about this to death. You talked about this to death, but like, just to spell it out, what the catechism actually says about women working outside the home. This is where the disagreements start to pour in uh, per permission to leave Friends the house. Gone. It's me now. I, I managed to yeah. get around my appointment. I'm here. So. It's good to have you back, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. So, so there's all this, this hoopla, and that's where you guys were like going back and forth in your debate, women working outside the home. Uh, what does it actually say? I mean, if I get as definitive as we can get here about how the catechism spells, spells this out, women working outside the home. Well, in his video, his 12 minute video, um, J froze. He said that because the catechism says, see if this follows, women are not allowed, or they're supposed to love to stay home. They're only allowed to go abroad, go outside, outdoors with grave necessity. This is um, delimitative, delimitative of pretty much all activities outside, uh, out of the home. They really need to be in the home maximally. Um, because it doesn't stipulate the many, many things that they're precluded from doing out of doors. Um, somehow 
it's like a double inverse. And this means that they can do the worst thing, the worst thing that they could do out of doors that the tradition has been, had been very clear about. Sirach says, you know, they should never be working. Um, it just makes no sense. And then, you know, I mean, you go through, um, even pious the, hold on, let me find it. Um, there's just so much clarity, even in the 20th century on, okay, yes, because when the catechism made this stipulation, no women were trying to work in like the 1500s. They were just saying women should really probably not even do a lot of errands around town without their husbands. And that's before they even had automobiles. I like, um, yesterday in my show, I had women, uh, I had, um, um, what's her face, a uh, Pat the SNL comedian who kind of hate follows me and staff um, in the comments say, Oh, now Tim admitted it. He, Tim finally admitted it. He doesn't think women should drive. I was like, I wasn't trying to sit on that. I, I just don't want everyone to die. And women are inherently awful drivers. So it's, it's odd. I, I literally am just afraid when I hear there's a woman on the road and, and Steph's an awful driver and gets in accidents like most women, you know, at any time she's driving. So, um, so the, the, the bigger point is, yes, women aren't supposed to be going around. That's in the 1500s before they could drive and before any women were trying to work. Once the, the, the communists and other subversives started trying to get them to work with intentional, adumbrated motive of splitting up the family and getting them hooked on two incomes, 85% of all marital infidelity happens in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, getting women away from their children, hearth and home. Um, well, that's just obvious, right? That's just obvious. That didn't even happen until the 20th century. And yet, um, so so that would be the worst instance of what a, why a woman would leave her home. Sorry if I'm sort of beleaguering it. But um, let me read, um, this is Benedict 15. With, with religion's decline, cultured women have lost their sense of shame along with their piety. Many, in order to take up tasks ill-befitting their sex, um, took to imitating men. Sounds just gender dysphoric now. Others abandoned the duties of wives for which they are formed to be cast in the current of life. Um, then we have the very next Pope, Pius XI, saying wifely, he's talking about wifely work outside the home, is the debasing of the womanly character and the dignity of motherhood of the whole family, as a result of which the husband suffers the loss of his wife, the kids of their mother, the home and family of an ever-watchful guardian, this false liberty and unnatural equality with the husband is to the detriment of the woman herself. For if the woman descends from a regal throne, he means by going into the workplace, she will soon be reduced to the old state of slavery and become as among the pagans, a mere instrument of man. Think of the Me Too movement. Think of all the women that get sexually harassed in the workplace. Think of how much they destroyed the workplace environment. Finally, he says to abuse the year, this is still Pius XI, to abuse the years of childhood and limited strength of women is grossly wrong. He means through work or having them out of the home. Mothers should work in the home or its immediate vicinity. He's just saying women can help their farmer husbands in, in the curtilage. It is an intolerable abuse. This is the funny part. Trent says this. It is an intolerable abuse to be abolished at all cost, at whatever cost, for mothers to be forced to engage in gainful occupations outside the home. And he talks about how communism put women in the workplace to to um, get women from away from kids. Um, I mean, there. Oh, okay. Here's Pius twelve. I can't skip this one. Has woman's position been thereby improved? He's talking about the women that went into the workplace, like the riveters in World War II. Equality of rights with man brought her abandonment of home, where she reigned queen. Second time we hear that she's queen at home basically a sex slave outside of home and her subjection to the same work strain and hours entailing depreciation of her true dignity and the solid foundation of her rights or feminine role. We see a woman who in order to augment her husband's earnings betakes herself to a factory, leaving her house abandoned during her absence. The house untidy and small perhaps before becomes even more miserable for her lack of care. Um, this is just really, really clear by the way, the only reason it comes up in the 20th century is that reason I said before. Women have already been essentially banned from leaving the home except for grave necessity. I, I see women that are, are too, married women that are too obsessed with like making errand runs. And I think this doesn't look like you love to stay home and beautify it. Well, okay, the worst thing you can do didn't even come up till the 20th century. No one had even thought of this yet. 
until the late 19th century, put women in the workplace. That's why you have all the popes denying it right away. Trent's crazy to try to make this argument. I'll, I'll, I'll add the fo following point. I don't want to belabor it, but he and uh, Laura Horn tell a personal tale. It's a cautionary tale about when she was in the workplace, she got out because she was becoming too, too interpersonally intimate with a male coworker developing too close a friendship that that caused a problem okay this is this is something they say publicly i don't want to mock or, or be um flippant about the story but it's so odd to me to tell that story and to say so it's really dangerous you know 85 percent of all marital infidelity happens in the workplace it doesn't work out but yeah that tim gordon's a bad guy because he's saying that all women should avoid this well categorically it's the worst and the most likely occasion of marital infidelity. You told your story and you're saying, so it didn't work for us, but other people, yeah, go, go play with that dynamite. Go play with that poison. Sorry to take so long. Wow. It's just, it's undefend. It's indefensible. There's a, a really quick Ripperger argument as well regarding this which is that children have a natural law right to be raised by their mothers morally formed by their mothers and that's violated when the yeah. wife is working outside the home yeah vatican ii says this too the kids this is in gaudium at space the kids especially the younger ones need the care of their mother at home this domestic role must be safely preserved but here you get the fruity language through the uh, though the legitimate social progress of women should not be under uh, underrated. That's that's gay. And then you start getting that kind of stuff around Vatican II. After P Pius XII, you start getting all the hedging. So you get that in Gaudium et Spes, um, reflecting what uh, Will just said about Ripperger's argument. Pius, uh, sorry, Paul the Sixth, Vatican II Pope said, even in the glorified state in humans, the difference between sex exercises an important difference, much deeper than ethnic differences. And he goes on to say that this is important to identity, um, but he's not say, he's not leaning into the the divisive question of his time, the late sixties. Should women go to the workplace? Then you get le legitimately failing of mind throughout all the nineties. He's losing his mind literally. Um, um, John Paul II, but you get places where he says women need equal pay, and he's like, "Are you like? Are you talking?" He doesn't say married women. He says women need equal pay, but the, here in, um, um, I forget what document it is, he says the more sane thing to take up paid work outside the home is wrong from the point of view of the good of society and of the family. Um, Laborum at, at Exorcins, I think, is where he says that. But then other places he says women need equal pay. So he, he's he's pretty schizophrenic that that we have an explanation for that, though, you know. We can uh, we could do a, a part two of this. There's a few more points that we can get to. Yeah, I feel like most of mine are so long winded that it's usually part two. So if you guys are down to do that, because these are important points to to parse out, I think. So let's do yeah. that. Sure. Cool. We'll take it in for a landing then. All right, guys. So if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. You must spread the word, spread the good word, allow this to grow uh, to the glory of God. And we'll catch you next Friday. Guys, it was a pleasure. And Trent, we'll see you again, sir. We'd oh, like wait, to have him on. on the show. Let's have him on the show. And then we can right. have a full discussion. <laughs> right. Yeah, I 100 percent be down for that. Will. Thanks, guys. See you Thanks. next time. Thank you. Peace. God bless.